We saw a bishop dressed in white. We thought it was the Holy Father. Those words were written by Sister Lucia of Fatima in her description of the third secret vision. In the spring of 2008, I wrote an article in which I proposed my unique hypothesis on the identity of who is this bishop dressed in white. You may not know yet that I'm the source of the suggestion, which quite simply is this. Benedict XVI is that bishop of the third secret, and I explained why. Since I'm the originator of that theory, I'll briefly explain it, but I will first address a few newer facts. You're listening to Genesis 315. I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. I'm Mariana Bartold, the author of Fatima, The Signs and Secrets, and Guadalupe, Secrets of the Image, both which are available at Amazon. I'll start off by initially stating that attention is again refocused on Benedict XVI. Let's take a brief look at some of the news regarding him. For example, it became known a year ago that he spoke on certain moral issues in regard to the spreading influence of the spirit of Antichrist. In fact, he said, quote, The fear of this spiritual power of the Antichrist is then only more than natural and really needs the help of prayers on the part of an entire diocese and of the universal church in order to resist it, unquote. It also became clearly known last year that he believes that he retains a spiritual mandate to the papacy. That in itself is a novel stance among the rare instances in church history when a man abdicated the papacy. In the past, none of them were addressed or wished to be addressed as Pope Emeritus, and none thought that they had retained any part of the papal office. Objectively, it cannot be done, because only one man can fulfill the papal office. Christ himself instituted the hierarchy, and he appointed one man to the papal throne. However, as a result of Benedict's choices and his intermittent commentary on church business, Catholics and media alike tend to anticipate, if not outright hope, that whenever a controversial topic arises, Benedict XVI will issue a statement. Now that his 2007 motu proprio, Sumorum Pontificum, was recently revoked by Pope Francis, Catholics are hoping that Benedict XVI will also comment on that event. While I personally don't think that will happen, he did make recent remarks on the church's situation in Germany. Other commentators are offering their own ideas on what he really meant, so for now, I will bring the focus back to the overall important message, which is the message of Fatima and Benedict and the third secret of Fatima, which is again on whether or not Benedict XVI could be the third secret's prophesied bishop in white. As I said at the start of this broadcast, it was in an article published in 2008 that I offered my conjecture on who is a bishop dressed in white. Not quite three years after the publication of my theory, Benedict XVI announced in February of 2011 his upcoming abdication of the papal office. The moment he announced it, many Catholics who had previously read of my proposition, or if you want to call it a theory, about Benedict being the bishop dressed in white, immediately began repeating in private discussions, online discussions, and even in articles. That said, not many mentioned the source of that speculation, which I believe is an educated one since I have studied Fatima for decades. But in the meantime, I will say that Benedict the Sixteenth let it be known in February 2011 that after his formal relinquishment of the papacy, he would wear a simple white cassock but forgo the cape, which is a symbol of his total authority over the church. What gained so much media attention is what he said about his new title. He did not wish to be addressed as Bishop Emeritus of Rome, but rather he preferred Pope Emeritus. With Benedict's announcement, my earlier hypothesis that he is the third secret's bishop dressed in white spread like wildfire. Today, I will address what I also said in my book, Fatima, The Science and Secrets, which highlights a few points on how I came to that premise. You see, that proposition of mine goes back to Our Lady of Fatima and her specific request to the church militant, including the Pope and the bishops. In addition to the collegial consecration of Russia, to her Immaculate Heart, the Madonna also commanded the church-wide promulgation of the Five First Saturdays. Sister Lucia, as always, let her superiors know about these messages from heaven, and she was asked why the devotion would consist of five Saturdays, but not, for example, nine or twelve. Lucia, for her part, immediately began praying for an answer to that question. Now let's pay attention to the date upon which she received the heavenly response. On the night of May 29th through the 30th, 1930, our Lord answered her, revealing to Lucia five reasons for the five first Saturdays of reparation.
Commission. And he said to her, quote, My daughter, the reason is simple. There are five kinds of offenses and blasphemies uttered against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Blasphemies against the Immaculate Conception. Blasphemies against her perpetual virginity. Blasphemies against her divine maternity while refusing at the same time to recognize her as mother of men. The blasphemies of those who publicly seek to place in the hearts of children indifference or scorn or even hatred towards this immaculate mother. And five, the offenses of those who outrage her directly in her holy images. Now, why did I point out the date? Well, it is because, as I explain in my book, Fatima, The Signs and Secrets, it was exactly 68 years before, on May 30th, 1862, that St. John Bosco related his incredible dream, noted as the two columns in the sea, in which frequent communion and Marian devotion are the church's pillars, and to which the bark of Peter, after many battles and much confusion, securely ties itself. By the way, to ensure that you don't miss any of my new podcasts, please make sure to give this episode a thumbs up. And also, if you have not done so already, subscribe to Genesis 315. And for those two actions, I sincerely thank you. In his dream, the details of which should not be glossed over, St. Bosco said that he stood on an isolated rock, unable to see any other patch of land other than that under his feet. From that spot, he saw what he described as a vast sheet of water with, quote, an innumerable fleet of ships in battle array. The prows of the ships are formed into sharp spear-like points so that wherever they are thrust, they pierce and completely destroy. These ships are armed with cannons, with lots of rifles, with incendiary materials, with other arms of all kinds, and also with books. And they advance against a ship very much bigger and higher than themselves and try to dash against it with the prows or burn it or in some way to do it every possible harm. As escorts to the majestic fully equipped ship, there are many smaller ships which receive commands by signal from it and carry out movements to defend themselves from the opposing fleet, unquote. In the sea's midst stood what he called two mighty columns of great height. Upon this taller pillar rested a host of great size, and underneath it was a placard that featured the word Salvation of the Faithful, and upon the shorter one stood a statue of the Immaculate Virgin, Help of Christians. The saint also related, quote, The supreme commander on the big ship is the sovereign pontiff, unquote. After the pontiff calls a council, the captains of the smaller ships boarded the vessel and held a meeting. But, quote, the wind and the waves gather in a storm, so they are sent back to control their own ships. There comes a short lull. For a second time, the pope gathers the captains together around him while the flagship goes on its course. But the frightful storm returns. The pope stands at the helm, and all his energies are directed to steering the ship toward those two columns, from the top of which, and from every side of which, are hanging numerous anchors and and big hooks fastened to chains, unquote. The great ship's adversaries maintain a relentless battle to stop and sink the great ship. At times, this great ship suffers what St. John Basso described as large, deep gaps in its side. But, he said, quote, a gentle breeze blows from the two columns and the cracks close up and the gaps are stopped immediately, unquote. The enemy's weapons are blown up or broken, and many of their ships shatter or sink. Quote, then the frenzied enemies strive to fight hand to hand with fists, with blows, with blasphemy, and with curses. All at once, the Pope falls gravely wounded. Immediately, those who are with him run to help him, and they lift him up. A second time the Pope is struck, he falls again and dies. A shout of victory and of joy rings out amongst the enemies. From their ships, an unspeakable mockery arises. But hardly is the pontiff dead than another pope takes his place. The pilots, having met together, have elected the pope so promptly that the news of the death of the pope coincides with the news of the election of the new successor." It is this immediately elected Pope who puts the enemies to rout and, quote, guides the ship right up to the two columns and comes to rest between them, unquote, securely fastening the bark, first to the pillar of the host and then to the pillar of the Virgin. St. John Bosco asked Father Rua, one of his fellow priests, his opinion of the dream. Father Rua responded, quote, it seems to me that the Pope's ship might mean the church, of which he is the head. The ships, men. The sea, this world. Those who defend the big ship are the good, lovingly attached to the Holy See. The others are her enemies who try with every kind of weapon to annihilate her. The two columns of salvation seem to be devotion to Mary Most Holy and to the Blessed Sacrament and the Eucharist." St. John Bosco responded, "'You are right.' 
only I ought to correct one expression. The enemy ships are persecutions. The most serious trials for the church are near at hand. That which has been so far is almost nothing in the face of that which must befall. Her enemies are represented by the ships that tried to sink the principal ship if they could. Only two means are left to save her amidst so much confusion, devotion to Mary Most Holy and frequent communion, making use of every means and doing our best to practice them and having them practiced everywhere and by everybody, unquote. So that is what took me to Fatima's third secret vision in considering this pope who is attacked in some way, rises, and then is attacked again and dies. So, in looking at the description of Vatima's third secret vision, we see that Lucia wrote, quote, The Holy Father passed through a big city, half in ruins and half trembling with halting step, afflicted with pain and sorrow. He prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him. And in the same way, there died one after another the other bishops, priests, men and women religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross, there were two angels, each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs, and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God." Unquote. Now, what I read to you is only a part of the third secret description. You can find it at the Vatican website and probably others too, and it's called simply The Message of Fatima. Now, when that third secret was released back in June of 2000, Cardinal Rat Singer said of the press release that day that it was not the intention of the church to impose any single interpretation. That's something that is often overlooked, but it cannot be forgotten. And so years ago, as I was contemplating the entire message and remembering the prophecy of St. John Bosco, as well as other prophecies, I recalled that the fate of a future pope was also related by none other than Pope St. Pius X, when he was heard to say, quote, I saw one of my successors by name fleeing over the corpses of his brethren. He will flee to a place for a short respite where he is unknown, but he himself will die a cruel death, unquote. There was another vision of the Pope, which I also mentioned at the time. But the point here is that we see similarities with the vision of St. John Bosco and with the vision of Pope St. Pius X and the third secret of Fatima, which was given by word and by a vision to three shepherd children. Now, in the third secret vision, the Pope walks half trembling and with halting step, which indicates advanced age, or it also could indicate that he was extremely tired, had been put under persecution, was fleeing an escape, etc. So as for Pope St. Pius X's vision, it may be that a future Pope will take the name of Pius, as I said all those years ago, but... At that point, I introduced my hypothesis, which is another consideration. Pope St. Pius X's baptismal name was Giuseppe Sarto. And in Italian, Giuseppe in English means Joseph, which is the baptismal name of Joseph Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XVI and is now Pope Emeritus of Rome, a bishop who dresses in white. Now, all that said, you might recall that when the Third Secret Vision was released back in June of 2000, as I said, it was Cardinal Ratzinger who said that the Church did not intend to impose one single interpretation. And yet the Vatican commentator said quite plainly that Pope John Paul II, who was then the reigning Pope, was the bishop dressed in white. But many Catholics, including myself, did not believe it. Years later, in May of 2017, which, by the way, was the centennial year for the Fatima apparitions, Pope Francis surprised and startled many Catholics when he called himself the bishop dressed in white. Now, many people have commented on what he meant, but in the meantime, it's very interesting that he called himself the bishop dressed in white. Those are the exact words from the third secret of Fatima, and we have to wonder, of course, naturally, what he did mean. So, who is the bishop dressed in white? Is it Benedict XVI? Is it Pope Francis? Or is it perhaps a future pope? Related to that question are quite a few others, including one that should be obvious. If the three Fatima children thought the bishop in white was the Holy Father, was he? In a future episode, I will discuss more on those questions. But for now, I will again say what I have in the past so often written. And here it is. Benedict XVI was the first and only pope to ascend the throne of stewardship of the Catholic city, already possessing full knowledge of the third secret of Fatima. He has known it for almost 40 years. And that means he bears a great responsibility to God, for he also did not release the third secret in full, which the Blessed Mother commanded had to be done. And he also did not 
not ensure that the Virgin's other commands to the Pope and the bishops were explicitly fulfilled. Those are matters about which to seriously think, because he had at least two decades to ponder the third secret. And the reason I'm saying that is because he let it be known in 1984 that he had indeed read the third secret, so that by the time he became the Pope, he had at least two decades to ponder it. I have a question. Do you think that Benedict XVI has an even greater responsibility to the church to explicitly obey Our Lady of Fatima? Or perhaps I should put it in these terms, did he have a greater responsibility? But here's another one. Do you think that the bishop in white is Benedict XVI, Francis, or a future pope? And why do you think as you do? Until the next time, may God bless you, and may Our Lady Mary keep you and yours under her starry mantle. Salve, Regina.